So I would like to welcome Ms. Harriet Ter Terrett, is that how you pronounce it? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, from the UK, from the very, very international law firm of Jones Day, who has a very, very distinguished and mixed background, not only in commercial law matters, which to even lawyers can be dry and boring, but also humanitarian, and, and what she's going to talk about today deals with very much uh, women and traffic trafficking of people, um, amongst other topics. Um, just a warning, if you like to call it that, or flagging, some of the content um, may be disturbing to some of you. If you are, do feel free to leave. Uh, we won't fault you for it, but there will not be any graphics, so it's just like the, the the imagery from the words may upset some of you because especially some of our younger students who may not be exposed to what goes around what goes on around the world because I mean I'm Australian and I can tell you that I find that the Singaporean students are very, very blessed and that they shelter. But in a way, it's not a good thing if you just get thrown out in the whole world. So just give you a, a warning about Harriet's talk. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name's Harriet Terrett. I'm a partner in uh, the global law firm. Ooh, there we go, let me just turn this way. Go. Just to mention, um, in terms of format, uh, as the professor mentioned, there's no graphic imagery in this, but we are going to be talking about exploitation of people. We're going to be talking about forced labor. We're going to be talking about sexual exploitation. And probably most upsettingly, we're going to be talking about child exploitation. One thing I will say to you, and there's a little part of me that wishes I had never started down this path, because once you know this stuff, it's impossible to unknow it. You see things in a different way. You understand the world around you in a different way. Um, I'm very happy to take questions as we go through. We're a comparatively small group. If you have questions, it, it is a technology-focused talk, I promise you. And I can talk about the technology. But if people have questions, just shout out, put your hand up. Very happy to do it like that, rather than do it at the end. So, I'm a partner at a firm called Jones Day. It's probably the biggest law firm you've never heard of. Um, so, we are in, let me get this right, 43 offices in 18 countries in five continents. We have 2,400 lawyers, roughly, at the last count. We are the fourth, sometimes the fifth biggest law firm in the world. And most importantly, over half of our lawyers are based outside of the US. So even though you'll often hear us described as a US law firm, and that's certainly our roots and our history over about 250 years, we prefer, particularly those of us that live outside the US, we like to think of ourselves as a global law firm. We have a base here in Singapore. We work very closely with many big Singaporean law firms. We tend to focus on what you call inbound work. So global clients coming to Singapore to do business, of which there are very many because of Singapore's opportunities. So what I'm going to talk to you about today comes out of our pro bono projects. Um, I thought I'd get the stats. So in 2018, and one of the things I really like about being at a firm that's not a US firm, but used to be, um, is the commitment to public service. It's one thing the Americans have just read down. Everyone has a role at a non-profit. Everyone gives back to charity. It's seen as important. And that's actually very consistent with a lot of the principles in Asia. So a lot of people give back to their community. This is what we did last year. And I've highlighted the bit that I think is most interesting. So we opened for 400 545 clients, 660 new matters, 41 of our 43 offices. And we basically did 1 million US dollars of free time last year in pro bono services. We also paid, we have something called the Jones Day Foundation, it's paid for by the partners, about another $20 million in hard cash to support the projects we're doing. So it's, it's a big part of what we are and who we do. Um, one of the things we do is the anti-human trafficking project. And that's really where my involvement comes in. So the anti-human trafficking initiative has been running at Jones Day for about 10 years, and we do a range of things. I'm only going to talk about one of them, but just so you have the full picture. We take on individual cases. So these are victims of trafficking. Particularly in the US, there are statutes that allow you to seek compensation, both from your traffickers when they can be identified, and also from the public systems that fail to support you. Something like 39 different states have these individual laws. We take on cases for individuals, often children who've been trafficked. 
we get them compensation, we get them medical care, we get them back to their families and help them sort of re-inculcate re in their communities. Another big thing we do is involved in wiping criminal records. The vast majority of trafficking victims will have a criminal record, whether it's for solicitation, whether it's for some kind of petty criminal offence like forced begging. They've earned that criminal record because they've been put in a position where they've had to do those things. It is unfair that the rest of their life, their ability to you know, go to school, to hire a flat, to get a job, is affected by that criminal record. And most states, Singapore included, for those of you who didn't know that, have laws that say criminal records can be wiped in certain circumstances. But if you are not literate, you don't speak the language, how do you even start with that? So we have a program where we take individual clients and we get their criminal records wiped using the processes and the laws that exist under those systems. Healthcare is a big piece for us. 88% of trafficking victims will have some kind of interaction with a healthcare professional at some point. They've been beaten up, they're ill, they've you know, had all sorts of issues. If you're a sex worker, you may be pregnant. Um, there is a huge efficiency that can be gained by putting trafficking initiatives in healthcare systems. You identify victims more quickly, you can rescue them more quickly, you can get them better care. Preventing trafficking or forced labour in supply chains, that's what I'm going to talk about today, so we'll sort of put through that. One other thing to pick up on, what we call post-disaster community outreach is a really important one. One thing that we've learned over the last 10 years is that instant instances of trafficking go up in a disaster situation. And if you think about it, people who have nothing left to sell, they sell themselves. If you are trying to rebuild a community after a disaster, you are not very picky about where your labour comes from. So what you see in, we saw this in Hurricane Katrina in the US, huge numbers of people trafficked into the US specifically to deal with the disaster relief. And there are small communities that are dealing with this. It's not the big cities. And they are totally unprepared. They don't recognise it. They don't know how to treat it. They don't know how to prevent it. So we run a programme that works with smaller communities that have experienced disasters or who have event issues. So when the Olympics comes to town, you know, communities outside the centres will often experience a big uptake in forced labour, forced trafficking, giving them free tools to help them manage those issues and help support people. We do a lot of other stuff as well. That's less interesting, so I will sort of keep moving through. A couple of things I did want to mention. We have two Jones Day offices that you will not see on our website. One is on Laredo. Laredo is a tiny two-horse town in the western parlance. It sits on the uh, Texas-Mexico border. It is one of the most significant entry points for refugees and asylum seekers from uh, the southern part of the continental United States to the northern part. There are huge detention centres in Laredo. It's the place where they put all of the unaccompanied minors. Those people have no access to legal care. So we, over the years, have basically set up a Jones Day office. We supply free legal advice based on the rule of law with asylum applications um, to help people who are trying to cross into the American border to make sure they are properly represented when their applications are denied. It wasn't set up as a human trafficking project, but one thing we've learned is that actually you get a lot of human trafficking victims that come through there, so we now have a separate piece that just works with them, and that's just some of the photos. We have 150 lawyers, we staff it full time, we have clients who come and work with us and actually come down and give the advice there. We also have a similar project in Lesbos in Greece, again that's looking at uh, um, refugees coming in and asylum seekers into Europe through the Greek islands, huge numbers of economic migrants and people coming through that. One thing I will say, those pictures make it look quite pretty, it's all blue skies and blue seas, I've been there, it is unremittingly grim, it really is, it's the most horrible experience you can possibly have and it's a really worthwhile thing to do to try and help people that have put their lives on the line to come through. So I, I just sort of mention that to say, we're trying to do this end to end. Anyway, this is not why you came here, so I will get on to, to why I'm actually talking about technology. But I thought I would tell you a little bit about my journey. So I'm a litigator by background. I advise um, 
companies, banks, financial institutions on risk and governance procedures. I was asked a few years ago to describe my practice in less than 10 words. And this is what I came up with. Anything you can go to prison for. Fraud, bribery, corruption, sanctions, money laundering, all of the bad stuff that companies get caught up in, that is what I do. Um, so more it's than 10 words. More <laughs> <laughs> so, and I, again, I like to think of it as an end-to-end -end service. And what I mean by that is I will work with the company to put systems and controls in place to stop the bad actions from happening. I will investigate matters when things happen that the company identifies from its systems. And ultimately, if I have to, I will defend that company. And sometimes it's very senior individual directors from prosecutions, whether they're civil, criminal, or regulatory. Hopefully, the prosecution is not because I got the system wrong at the beginning, but you know, rather, it's much more likely that something has gone wrong. So how did I then get into technology? Well, I'll tell you, in March 2014, I was asked to go and speak at something called the London Fintech Week, the first time it was ever been done. Last year, London Fintech Week had 2,000 guests. It ran over five days. It had 80 exhibitors. Let me tell you, it was not like that in March 2014. There was me. There were 17 fintech startups, so financial technology startups. There were 20 angel investors, and I don't know whether that term works in Singapore, people working at the, the very first stage of investment, some banks, and I was asked by a friend of mine who was setting this up, would I go in and talk about the importance of money laundering and know your client rules to these fintech startups? And let me tell you, it was not a successful presentation <laughs> because the fintechs were not interested in hearing about rules and regulations. And the banks and the investors got more and more horrified as they realized these guys had no interest in the, the things. So it, it was not good. And Luis, he's invited me back, my friend, to speak subsequently. But I, at the break, I sat next to a guy wearing a T-shirt. OK, this is not the T-shirt that he was wearing. If I had known how important this T-shirt was to this story, I would have taken a picture. But the T-shirt was pink, and it said, Bitcoin how dragons pay elves for mining. <laughs> and so, and I, I had heard of Bitcoin, but I didn't know anything about it, so I asked him about it, and he told me about Bitcoin. He told me about blockchain and the underlying system that sits on, on Bitcoin, and he had just resigned from his very well-paid hedge fund job to become the third full-time employee of a little startup now known as Ethereum. So he was their third full-time employee. He has retired, let me tell you. <laughs> he was their chief compliance officer. He's a lovely guy. He's called Stefan Tool. If you're ever interested in hearing the true story of Ethereum, he speaks publicly all the time. He's a really interesting guy. Um, so I came back to my office, and I called up my boss. And my boss is a guy called Jay Tambay. He originally comes from Pune. He now runs our financial institutions practice. He is famous for saying, don't tell me what's happening in your market now. I don't care. Tell me what's going to happen in five years' time. Tell me what you're doing to develop that practice. And I was like, right, Jay, I've got it. I've got something brilliant for you. So I phoned him up and I said, blockchain, we should be into this. And he's like, yeah, go and speak to your colleague, Stephen Obi. He's been doing this for six months. So I was disappointed that I hadn't been that first person. But with my colleague, Stephen, for the last five years, I've been running our blockchain and digital currency initiative. Blockchain has been very interesting for a lot of people. If I, you want me to tell you where I think we are now, one for the Pulp Fiction fans amongst you. Um, this is a real sticker, by the way. My husband bought me this sticker. This is my laptop that it sits on. <laughs> now, every time I mention blockchain, I was like, oh, blockchain. Um, it's been a little overhyped, it's fair to say. And even yesterday at the NTISH roundtable, someone turned to me and said, oh, blockchain, it's just a flash in the plan, nothing will happen. My personal view, I'm a blockchain realist. I'm not an evangelist. There are some things that blockchain does brilliantly. There are other things that it does, but it's not efficient, it's not quick, it's not any better than the current technology that exists. So there are some things where I think blockchain will dramatically change the way business gets done. But the chances are you and I will never see it. It will sit at the background. So it'll be in payments, it'll be in trade finance, it'll be in um, 
you know, blockchain supply chains. A lot of that will end up being done by blockchain, but the average person on the street will never see it, have never have any sense that it really exists. Um, for those of you who are still skeptics, now normally I do this presentation to lawyers and I have to explain to them what the Gartner hype cycle is. I'm guessing with a bunch of technology people, some of you will be familiar with this. So Gartner, probably one of the best known consultancies, tech consultancies, every year it publishes this hype cycle and it tracks advanced technologies against where they sit on the effectively the, the amount of uptake. And I've highlighted blockchain and one thing that's really important to understand is the cycle of what they call the peak of inflated expectations and then the trough of disillusionment when everyone thinks it's useless. This is exactly what happens with every new technology. It's not unique to blockchain. Every new technology goes through this process and what that means is actually we are no more than five to ten years away from a productive use of that technology. Now Gartner you know, they're still projecting into the future, but they have a very good track record of getting it right. So for the people who are skeptical, show them this. It will also be true for some of the other things that we're going to talk about. AI, autonomous vehicles, PAAS. If you are in this area and you're not following the Gartner hype cycle, I would definitely recommend it. I find their analysis really useful. So, how did I end up here today? Well, here, for you students, here is a one piece of life lesson advice for you. When someone very senior in your organisation walks into your room and says, you know about that thing, in my case blockchain, do you think blockchain could be used to, I don't know, maybe kind of combat human trafficking? Don't do what I did, which is say, well, yeah, no, that's really interesting. Here's the five or six things that I think we could do, because what you'll do is find yourself in my position, where you're running a team of six people and the only instruction you have is we expect you to change the world for the better we want you to make the firm look good when you do it you have six months to come up with a plan come back and tell us what you think we should be doing in this space and i have spent the last three to four months working with clients like micron working with people in singapore and elsewhere working with professor chan at the ntu just trying to understand more about this space and that's how I've ended up here today. Um, I know some of you were at the round table yesterday and you know about the Institute's launch, that's why you're here. One thing I will say is that I think it is incredibly impressive that the leadership and the academic staff of the NTU have put the Institute together because they are trying to address one of the most challenging questions we face as a society today. What is the right balance between technological development and protecting society. These are not easy questions, there are no easy answers. And so I'm gonna try and respect that by giving a presentation about trafficking and tech that acknowledges they are complex questions with no easy answers. Um, it's not a very cheerful presentation until you get right to the very end. And I have to say, I am very optimistic about some of the solutions that we have. I have to say, I think the solutions are much more likely to be sitting with the younger people in the room than they are with the rest of us older people, but I'll come and explain why that is. So, what is human trafficking? So, I've put up here just three definitions, and I hope people can kind of see them in the room. The first one, and I have to get this right, is from the US Department of Homeland Security. Um, the second one, is from an NGO who puts out, and the third one, which is the one that most people talk about, this is the UN definition of human trafficking. The recruitment, transportation, transfer, harboring, or receipt of persons by means of the threat or the use of force or coercion of abduction of fraud or the abuse of power. Um, really all I want to say about that, because this is not a law lecture, I promise you, even though I am a lawyer, is a couple of things. This is the one technical bit. You'll see up here two different terms, human trafficking and modern slavery, and people use them interchangeably. If you want to get really technical, modern slavery is the umbrella term that covers a whole range of actions. So forced labor, forced marriage, human trafficking, all sit under this umbrella of modern slavery. Um, but really, people use them interchangeably. There is a huge amount of behaviour that sits under these things. So it's forced prostitution, forced marriage, uh, forced begging, forced criminality, 
domestic servitude, so where people are domestic laborers, they receive no pay for that. Uh, child soldiers come under human trafficking, and most horrifically, in my view, forced organ removal, which is a particular issue in, in parts of Southeast Asia particularly. Um, contrary to a very common misconception, people do not have to be moved across borders to be trafficked. What trafficking refers to is the use of force or coercion in order to, you know, whether it's labour or whether it's marriage or some other kind of sex work or something like that, it's the force and coercion that makes it trafficking. That's in the case of adults. In the case of children, you don't necessarily need to force. Merely taking a child into a vulnerable place where they can be exploited because they are not capable of saying no necessarily and they're particularly vulnerable, you don't need that element of force and coercion. Um, a couple of things I did want to say is that uh, sex exploitation gets a lot of the press. People tend to think that's most of what happens. It isn't. It's comparatively hardly any of it. Forced labour is, by percentage terms, the single biggest trafficking issue that exists. And it affects as many men as it does women. So again, people think of forced labour and trafficking as being very much a gendered female issue. Females tend to be the victims. Although it's true that in percentage terms, far more women are affected than men. Actually, in the forced labour space, it's almost all men. Um, so a few numbers for the statisticians and political scientists amongst you that just sort of reflect that. Um, one thing I just wanted to say about the ratio of men to women, the ratio of men who are affected is going up, and it's going up quite dramatically. So it's 29%. Five years ago, it was as low as 13%. Now, that could be just about better data collection. We don't know. But actually, what it probably means is that efforts to affect female, particularly sex exploitation, are working. And so what you're seeing is proportionally a greater number of men affected. We're also seeing the results of effectively a very difficult period in time with wars in particularly the Middle East. That has definitely increased the number of men who are affected. So these things are not static. It's really important not to get too caught up on the numbers. Um, so that's the universal piece. I just wanted to give this a national overlay. I'm very conscious when I'm standing in Asia, I'm not competent to comment particularly on issues that exist in Asia. So I'm going to talk about the country that I'm most familiar with, the UK. These are the seven sectors that the UK government has identified as having the biggest risk of trafficking in the UK. And some of them really surprise me. Construction, particularly. I mean, we have the most regulated construction industry that exists. We're a European thing. And then I thought about it, and this is what I mean by saying, once you learn this stuff, you can't unlearn it. Every morning I drive down a road in London, it's called the Old Kent Road, and it's like a big road with shopping centres, but it's not like Orchard Road. It's kind of what I'd call big superstores. There's a, a Home Depot on there, there's a supermarket. It's, it's kind of a very lower end area of London. And every morning there are gangs of guys who are just standing on the corner by the car parks, of these places and that's the forced labour that exists in the UK for the construction industry. These are the guys who are undocumented, who will get picked up to do a day's labour, who hopefully will get paid but some of them may well be trafficked and therefore they have to hand that money over. So it's really important to understand that even in the most, I like to think the most developed societies where the rule of law is important, these things happen and they happen day to day. Um, even if, yes, Nail, what are they? Yeah. So when you get your nails done, you go in and kind of, yes. Yeah, so you get a pedicure, manicure, things like that. So even if you don't have a car, so you're not worried about the car washes, you don't use builders, you don't have a manicure, I'm afraid to say that you are not off the hook. G20 and developed country consumption is the single biggest driver of human trafficking. If you use a smartphone, if you buy clothes that are made outside of Singapore, if you eat fish, processed fish in your products, you are probably using and consuming something that has at some point been created through the process of human trafficking. That's just the reality of the situation. And there are some, there's a really good, I, I've, um, I've put all my sources on the bottom of the slides. If anyone's interested, I'm happy to give the rest. The Global Slavery Index is a really, really good document to look at because that's done some very empirical analysis about numbers. And they reckon, collectively, the G20 countries are importing around 
four, $354 billion of at-risk products annually, US dollars. Um, the smallest is Argentina with 739 million US. The largest is the US with 144 billion of at-risk products they import annually. This is a massive global trade. And some of this is actually state-sponsored. So North Korea in particular exports 98% of its coal to China. In North Korea, coal is mined through labor camps, political prisoners, and the very lowest caste of people. They aren't paid for mining the coal. It is one of the single engines of the North Korean engine. It effectively is state-sponsored human trafficking. And China imports that. They have great visibility of that. I'm not in any way going to get into the political aspects of that, but you have to understand that this drives big business, basically. So that's the depressing stuff. Now let's talk about what people are actually sort of doing to deal with this. A uh, couple of things happened really in the 2010 to 2016 period. And a lot of this was driven out of the UN. The UN gets a difficult reputation sometimes for being slow and ineffective. But actually sometimes I think there are times when it really comes together and does some quite impressive things. So in 2010, the United Nations adopted a global plan of action to combat human trafficking. In 2013, they decided that people hadn't done enough and they adopted another resolution which in, for UN terms was drafted in very stern terms, requiring people to take steps to identify human trafficking that existed within their countries. And then in 2016, they adopted something called the Sustainable Development Goals. Have people sort of heard of the SDGs? Is that something people, yes, a few nods. So these are effectively what the UN says this world has to do in order to develop sustainably by 2030. There's about 17 different goals. The one that I've identified is decent work and economic growth. There are about 12 things under goal eight, but one of them relates to forced labor. What that means is that if you are a UN member state, you have to now try and do some of these things. And what we've seen are countries try and put in place laws, systems, processes to really escalate this issue of human trafficking. So again, in the UK, we have something called the Modern Slavery Act. Uh, it was brought in in 2015. It requires companies over a certain size to make public statements about their supply chains. You have to explain what steps you've taken as a company to get rid of modern slavery in your supply chain. It's what I kind of call regulation by transparency. And it's, it's possibly slightly more of a Western concept, but more and more countries are adopting it. So regulators know that they don't have the time or resources to do micro-regulation. What they do is they require companies to put information out into the public domain so that other people can look at it and assess for themselves whether they're complying. So if you are a UK company, there will be NGOs, non-governmental organisations, that will look at your statement and will say, are you doing enough? Have you really looked at all of these things? And it effectively, it's privatisation of regulation, basically. It's a really interesting development. I can't quite see it happening in Singapore yet. Your regulatory system is a little bit more focused on the government doing that, but it, it, it may come. So, uh, just, please. Just to update you, mm. the, certainly in Singapore, the SGA, the Singapore Stock Exchange, has adopted this kind of model over the past oh, really? 10 years. Yeah, especially when it comes to sustainability reporting, because they simply do not have the resources and time to to monitor everybody, but they require companies to put forward their sustainability reporting statements. So it, it is a model that's that really being adopted here. And are you seeing then an up uptick in NGOs kind of analysing that data and using it, or shareholders being focused on it? I think shareholders, especially the, the funds. Yeah, the okay. Funds, the, the funds, because, I mean, not necessarily because they're interested to protect, but rather they are also wanting it for maybe publicity. Got it. Okay. Well, no, that's really interesting. I might ask you about that because I can add it to my list. So now we're actually going to get to the technology. Apologies, but I just did want everyone to have the same base level. So I've spent the last six months looking at tech solutions for human trafficking. There are hundreds out there. There are so many people focusing on this. What I thought I would do today is give you a flavor of some of the ones that I think are particularly interesting. And I would put them into three broad categories. Data-driven solutions, 
analysis-driven solutions, and supply chain solutions. So the first one I want to talk about is Polaris. Polaris is probably the most simple of all the solutions. What Polaris does, and if anyone's interested in the slides, I'm very happy to leave a copy with it so people don't feel like they have, I mean, you're welcome to take photos, but if you'd like the actual slides, I'm very happy to make them available. Um, so what Polaris is, is a helpline for people who've been trafficked. If you've been trafficked in the United States, there are free phone numbers. You can text them, you can WhatsApp them, you can call them, you can get support. It's free. People will even come and pick you up. Um, it's a, a private NGO service and Polaris has been running for about 20 years. But what Polaris discovered is because of that work it was doing with its helpline, it had a deep driven data set about where human trafficking existed. And so about five years ago, they started making that data available publicly. And what you see here is the Polaris heat map. So this tracks the incidence of human trafficking reporting in the US. Why is that data important? Well, data does two things. And apologies if I, I, I'm conscious there are some people there who live and breathe data and I'm telling you stuff you already know. But for those of you who don't, it does two things. One, it helps you plan. So if you know where human trafficking is likely to occur based on historical data, you can plan for dealing with it in the first place. The other thing it drives is budget. If you don't know you have a problem that you need to address as a government, you don't get budget for it. It's very simple. And you don't get budget just because you put your hand up and you say, oh, I think we've got a problem. Can we have $100 million? You have to do an evidence basis. You have to go out and prove to the government that there is a problem that needs to be resolved. And you have to allocate your resources. If you don't have this data, it's very difficult to drive the decisions that you need to take to effectively deal with this. So what's interesting at Polaris, really simple idea, driving a lot of very deep data-driven solutions. Now, let's talk about some of the limitations, because I promised I would be fair and honest about some of this stuff. Um, so Polaris enter all of this stuff manually. They've just started using some of the technology to effectively automate their data collection process. They don't use AI. They are very uncomfortable about using AI or any kind of analytics over it because they believe the confidentiality of the data is incredibly important to people. So they worry about, with good reason, you know, people, people collecting data and using that either for commercialized purposes, so they don't want to open up the data sets to other kinds of analysis. They worry about governments and people then coming after people who've been trafficked, who may be undocumented migrants. So there is a real tension between some of the solutions and actually protecting the privacy of these people, or if not protecting their privacy, understanding that by making their data available to the authorities, you know, in the United States or elsewhere, it has a lot of consequences. So Polaris, for the moment, has decided it's not going to use any kind of deep machine learning or AI to process the data. There are a lot of people, me included, who are trying to encourage them to do that and trying to think of ways that we could maybe safely share data, possibly using a blockchain system, but I, you know, that's just my personal view. Um, then you take the data-driven stuff to a next level. Now, this is a project which is absolutely amazing. I have no involvement in this, but I just think it's brilliant. It's called Slavery from Space. And what these guys do, so, um, and again, apologies for those who know a lot about this. Um, this is about using, and I'm going to use the actual correct uh, terminology, remote mapping technologies to drive human trafficking collection. So uh, something called the Brick Belt, and again, you may know all about this. Brick kilns in Southeast Asia are known hotspots for human trafficking. They exist in Pakistan, in India, and other parts of the world. There are huge numbers of undocumented migrants. There are forced migrants. There are huge numbers of children. So in 2016, Save the Children estimated, and is only an estimate, but it's still pretty shocking, 250,000 children under the age of nine work on a slave basis in the brick kilns in what they call this brick belt. They're very difficult to identify. They're very difficult to, to go and look at because they're in remote parts of the mountains often. They move a lot. So once the brick kiln has taken the natural resources, they literally pack it all up they drag it to the next site, they drop it down. So it's incredibly difficult to get the data that, again, drives the governments of those countries having to take action because you can prove they've got a problem. 
So what these guys came up with, they, they came up with a methodology where they took the high resolution satellite data from Google Earth that Google made available. And this is, a, this is the open access satellite imagery. It's been used for lots of different things. And they basically adopted a statistically significant sampling technique to identify um, areas that looked like they might have instances of brick kilns in there. They then used an online citizen engagement platform called Zoomiverse. I don't know whether anyone's ever used that there, but basically it has about 1.6 million re registered users. They crowdsourced effectively people who would review these images, who they would train up to, this is what a brick kiln looks like from space, and they would mark up, is this a brick kiln? Is it not a brick kiln? Um, they had about 10,000 images, they had about 500,000 people, and obviously just one person marking it isn't statistically significant. I think they had to have at least four people who identified the same image. And what they used that for was effectively to map the likely incidence of brick kilns across that whole area. Now, again, let's talk about whether that's useful or not. It helps with data collection, but it is only a statistical sample. It doesn't tell you whether they're actually there or not. So in order to then do something about it, you've actually got to go out and visit. So one interesting thing that they're now doing is, because it was a sample, looking at whether you can use AI technology rather than citizen review to speed up the process. And rather than doing sampling, could you actually look at the whole data set? Could you look at the data set in real time from some of these images? So the timing is a real problem, I should have said. So even if you know there was a brick kiln there six months ago, you have no idea if it's there now, and the chances are it's probably not. But if you could get access to real-time satellite imagery, there are now lots of commercial satellites that go over that area. Would they be prepared to share that data? Could you then do AI? Could you, in real time, identify these places, send groups out into Enforce? I think this is a really exciting project. And I have to say, it's literally run by two guys from their back bedroom. This is not, it got a certain amount of funding from Google and other things. This is not a big, fancy tech startup. It's literally two guys who do this in their back bedroom. So really exciting. If you ever get a chance to support them, I think it's incredibly worthwhile. So this one's another, this is where we get more into the sort of deep tech stuff and the picture doesn't really sort of cover it. So this is a lady called Rebecca Portnoff. She is a PhD candidate at UC Berkeley. Um, she, for her dissertation, created the first automated technique to identify adult advertisements tied to human trafficking rings. So what she did was, and she's now working, um, she's got her PhD, she's now working, she's been funded by a couple of the big tech companies to make, turn this into a suite of free online tools that any law enforcement can use. But I know you guys are interested in the tech, so just to give you a bit of background, online ads for people who are being sexually exploited are very common. They exist on the bright web, they exist on the dark web, they're on Craigslist, they're on all kinds of different places. They're not, certainly I don't know whether it's the same in Singapore, maybe it's a little different, but in, in the UK they're not difficult to find. There are hundreds and hundreds of advertisements and they're often for the same person. So the same trafficker will put on multiple advertisements in multiple places. You can very typically identify through analysis of the wording used whether the advert's been placed by the same person. Uh, it's a very labor intensive thing. You've got to go and find the ads. You've got to read them. The same person has to read the ads in order to be able to statistically assess if it's the same person. So this is an obvious thing for machine learning. So she relies on two at the time, very novel algorithms. Um, the first is a machine learning algorithm. It's rooted in stylometry, so that's the, the science of how people write. Um, it can identify people's writing style to a very high degree of confidence. So it can scan all of these online places. It can pick out ads that look if they've been written by the same person. That tells you that that person is probably someone who is profiting from sexual exploitation, and the people that they are advertising may well be victims of human trafficking. You don't know that, but there's a reasonable possibility. That's clever. What she then did, which is really clever, is she tied it 
to Bitcoin wallets. So the traditional way that you pay for these ads is using digital currencies. People think of Bitcoin particularly as being untraceable. Those of you who are know it's not, you might not know who the person is, but actually Bitcoin is one of the most open blockchains for data analysis. You can go to Bitcoin Explorer, you can track individual transactions, you can track individual wallets. So what she does is most of these places, they will file the advertisement at the exact timestamp that the payment is made. So if you know when the ad was filed, you can probably tie it to a range of payments that take place on the Bitcoin blockchain. One payment tied to one particular ad probably isn't, it isn't statistically significant. But if you can see that the same wallet consistently makes payments around the time that the ads you've identified are all posted, you can probably tie that wallet to a trafficker. The second thing I would say is anyone who thinks that just because you cannot identify the person in a wallet, the police can't track it, is kidding themselves. And I say that particularly here in Singapore, I'm working on a project for the Commonwealth, the association of 53 member states. It's on how do you regulate digital currencies. I'm working very closely with the Singapore police. Let me tell you, they are streets ahead of analysis tools to identify people using digital currencies. And it's, it's quite funny, actually. So the whole point of this project, this is a slightly digression, but we have time, so you'll forgive me. Um, the whole point of this project is if um, a smaller country, Aruba, Vanuatu, who's not as sophisticated, wants to know how to deal with digital currencies, this is a framework that people can potentially attach to their own things. And it's being very much driven by Singapore, Canada, the United Kingdom, uh, Australia. And some of these countries come and they sort of say, oh, well, how do you investigate a cryptocurrency thing? Here are our existing processes. How do we change them? And the Singapore police go, here's our process. And so they literally have this whole built from the ground up process. So anyone who thinks, one bit of advice for you, that cryptocurrencies, digital currencies are not traceable is absolutely kidding themselves, particularly here in Singapore. Um, so effectively what they're doing is for real time engagement in stopping human trafficking. So that is, believe it or not, quite a basic analysis driven approach. The second one I want to talk to you about is, I mean, it's, this, is, this is real time. So hands up anyone who's ever gone to a hotel or a function room, taken a selfie, put it on social media. Oh, come on, I don't believe it. <laughs> okay. I, this is a friend of mine, by the way, so I had to get clearance to you all these pictures. So, you know, so next time you do that, you may be helping combating, stopping human trafficking. So there is a project called Traffic Cam. And what they are doing is effectively building up an AI-driven data set of hotel rooms. So when people, and it's not just women, women and men are trafficked, people often take a photograph of them and put it online. This is the person that you could come and have sex with for money when you come to this room. So the hotel room will typically have certain features. The headboard will look a certain way, the sheets will look a certain way, the walls will look a certain way. If you build a big enough data set, you can probably identify the hotel chain. That's the easiest bit. You can potentially identify the location, the room, if you build a big enough data set. So what these guys are doing are taking, effectively, hotel selfies, either ones that they've asked people to take or ones they take from online. They're building a data set. And then when someone posts a picture, they are analysing in real time where that person is likely to be and potentially putting that, that information over to law enforcement and doing real-time interventions. So they have had a couple, two cases. Now, I know it doesn't sound like much, but it's a miracle, right? Two cases where people have actually gone and kicked down doors and rescued people from human trafficking because of this. Now, there are some big technical issues with it. So um, first thing you have to do is you have to take the victim of trafficking and the people out. So if you ever, as a matter of law, if you transfer an image of someone who's trafficked across the internet in most countries, including Singapore, that is a criminal offence. It doesn't matter if you're doing it for a good reason. It's a criminal offence. So you have to get rid of the people. You have to protect their privacy. You have to build up an image of the hotel room. It's really interesting. It probably only works, you know, in, so it's very hot in the US because you have more standardised hotel chains. The other issue with this is, Crime is like water, is my personal view. It will always find the path of least resistance. 
and sometimes you are just sticking fingers in holes to stop the water coming out. And the danger of some of this stuff is you get good enough at putting the holes in, stopping it, it just drives it underground. And we have certainly seen and sort of something that Traffic Cam is very concerned about. People are stopping using hotels. They've moved on to Airbnb, where the data set is not very good. Um, and so there's a, real, there's a real genuine traffic camera actually talking about should they continue with this project? Should they advertise it? Should they keep quiet about it? Because what's the risk that you drive the behaviour underground? The other thing they're very worried about is people using the technology other than for the intended purpose. Think about it. An ability to identify someone in a particular hotel room for victims of domestic violence, you know, boyfriends who want to find their girlfriends. There's all kinds of police. There's all kinds of privacy issues around using this technology. And the problem with it is now you can't put that genie back in the bottle. Okay, a government could build up a data set like that because these guys have done it and they've told everyone how they've done it, so it's out there now. So a lot of these technologies, technology is neutral. It's all about what you use it for. But these technologies for human trafficking, people are pushing them really hard because there's a good reason to do it. And we don't always think about the unintended consequences. <sighs> oh, there we go. Let me just go back. So um, now, I thought I'd kind of mix it up a little bit and show you a, a video. This is Jennifer. Jennifer is a little bit smug, I have to say, but she's very interested. This is another real-time supply chain transparency tool that is in operational. We have clients who use it, so I'm just going to kind of hopefully. This is Jennifer. She's the global procurement director for industry enterprises worldwide. Her job is to buy things. Lots of things. She buys the things that go into the other things that make up the things her company sells. And she does it on time and on budget. Nice job, Jen. Her CEO is famous for saying, if we want to increase our company's value, we have to increase our company's values. Values like open communication, positivity, pursuit of learning, casual Fridays, and fairness, which includes fair labor for everyone. Jen knows that one of the fastest growing concerns for her company and shareholders is the sustainability of planet and people, which includes challenges related to forced labor and child labor embedded in her supply chain. She needs the right tools to get the job done. That's why Jen uses Freedom by Made in a Free World. Freedom helps Jen expand her company's values by leveraging her purchase power. Here's how she does it. First, she uploads her purchases. Understanding your supply chain used to be difficult and time consuming. Freedom's robust database is designed to assist Jen regardless of how much information she has. She can view insights from the category level all the way down to raw materials. Jen can then link suppliers to her purchases, which helps her prioritize oversight. She can view risks in her purchases beyond tier one suppliers. She can even bench test and track her company's efforts against industry norms. Freedom helps Jen comply with new standards and protect her company's mission while protecting the world's most precious resource. And best of all, she doesn't need an entire team to do it. Good on you, Jen. You are a true leader. So I don't know how much of that kind of resonates or is clear, but effectively what uh, Made in a Free World does is it, it takes a lot of data about the risks that you are likely to have if you buy certain products. So if you buy laptops that are made in China, there's a reasonable risk that some element of that may have come from forced labour. What Made in a Free World does is, is go behind that. So it looks at the individual components, LCD displays, individual chips. It builds up a picture of if I buy this product, what is the risk that there is some element of human trafficking in that chain? Now, it's very interesting. You can then link it to a supplier. So if I buy this product from this particular supplier, what is that supplier's reputation? 
it effectively gives you a risk map. And for those of you who are in business and used to business, it's all about risk. The criticism that you have of something like that is it doesn't actually drive good behavior. It stops you from getting into trouble, basically. It doesn't stop you from buying the purchases. It merely tells you what your risk is if you do. But it's an interesting tool. The other thing that that tool can be criticized for is all it is is about making you kind of hit roughly the market average. It's not about making you a leader in these things. And there's a very old joke, and you're going to forgive me, particularly those of you who heard this before. There's two guys in the wood, and the bear starts chasing the two people, and one of the guys stops to put on his trainers. See, the people laughing know this joke already. And the first guy says, why are you putting on your trainers? You cannot outrun the bear. And the first guy tells the second guy, says, I don't need to outrun the bear. I just need to outrun you. And, and that is very true for businesses as well. People don't want to be at the top and they don't want to be at the bottom, they just want to be in the middle of the pack. So that is a great tool for being in the middle of the pack. It's not necessarily a great tool for really addressing some of the issues. But I'm now going to talk about, and this is my personal favorite, this is a blockchain-based trade, a company called Provenance. Now, Provenance has been looking, and there have been a lot of projects on this in the Southeast Asian fishing industry, particularly around tuna. They have run an eight-month project on tuna and skipjack tuna in Indonesia. They've brought together all of the results from these other projects, and they've effectively eliminated, for this type of thing, uh, both labor, forced labor issues and also sustainability issues from the supply chain. Um, it's probably easier to show you than to explain it, and you're, it's going to be far too small to read, so definitely get the slides. What's really interesting about this is this is an end-to-end -end system. So a lot of the other blockchain-based products have looked at the fishing piece, the supply piece, the production piece. This brings it all together. So I'm going to go and try and use my pointer and go, right, so here's your fish, right? And there's a reason they picked fish, and I'll see if anyone can work it out when we get to the end. You catch your fish, and you effectively use an NGO to engage with fishermen who are effectively want to produce sustainable products. So the NGO effectively signs off that this is a, a fisherman who's likely to catch fish in a sustainable way, who isn't the subject to forced labour. So it's not a total solution, because there's still the risk, but you have a trusted NGO. Fisherman catches fish, it tags the fish with an RFID tag. That tag then follows the fish throughout its life. So at the point when the fisherman sells it, he can get a better price because he's put it through this system where it is effectively certified as a sustainable non labor traffic piece. It goes up onto the blockchain. What these guys have done, which is really interesting, is blockchain is quite difficult for some people to use. I mean, it's quite technical. But one thing that Provenance found is even Indonesian fishermen, they all have a mobile phone and they can all use text. So what they use is effectively you catch the fish, you send a text, the text is tied to the RFID chip. It's a very simple system and then provenance effectively automatically upload that to the blockchain. Um, go to the supplier. When the um, processor of the fish gets it, they register the item, they register the RFID tag, they then process the item. When they cut the fish into pieces, and this is one of the other pieces, they found a way to effectively split the RFID tag. So effectively, you can have multiple RFID tags for bits of fish that go with the fish that's processed. Goes all the way through into the supermarket. Supermarket has a label they can put on the product. The label, in the same way, it affects the weight, the price, the barcode. They will add the RFID code to the system so that you, as the consumer, fishmonger, can, on your mobile phone, put in that RFID code, you can find out who caught the fish. You can find out where they caught it. You can be confident as a consumer that that piece of fish was not unsustainable, it was hand-dived, if it was supposed to be hand-dived, and it wasn't done by traffic labor. You pay a premium for that, right? Because that's how you get what pays for all of that. Um, hello. Hey. <laughs> I've just blown your mind, haven't I? <laughs> Yeah. That it has not, like, I mean, because the, the person who catches it could well be using slave labor. Mm -hmm. So we don't know that. So, so, so this, is, this is a really important point. So at the moment, the pilot only works with trusted fishermen. So the NGO 
who are, who are very well respected people, they effectively certify the individual fishermen. So a lot of tuna fishing, they, they're, they're not doing this with big boats and big fleets. So they're it's a way of monitoring the, the integrity of it. Correct. And then once it's uploaded to the blockchain, so one really big problem in food chains is what we call adulteration. And I don't know how well that word sort of translates, but, but you can have the best fish in the world, but if people put fake fish, so fish that has not been caught sustainably, has been used in labor into your supply chain, how do you know? Because it's all processed together. There's a couple of really smart things that these guys do that I'm really excited about and I'll come on to. So one of them is what they call a mass balance check. So this is effectively using, most factories are automated. The system is automated. You know what's coming in, you know what's going out. A plus B has to equal C. If A plus B does not equal C, someone has put stuff into the supply chain. And a lot of this monitoring is now being automated. It's being uploaded to the blockchain. And it's a really elegant solution for food adulteration, which is the really big problem. Um, it was an eight month trial. It was incredibly successful. It helped small individual fishermen, small family fishermen get a premium price for their project. It's expensive. I mean, let's be really clear about that. This, is, this was funded, but it's a definitely a proof of concept. We are working with a couple of clients in a couple of areas. Walmart is one of them uh, on things like Chinese greens, where there's a really big problem. This is a system that I think you're going to be seeing more of. It's a premium product. It's aimed, frankly, at the young people in the room who believe that transparency is important are willing to pay a premium for it. Hello. Hi. Uh, I work with Cybercrime and Wild uh, Foods. Years ago, I spoke at the Australian Institute of Criminology, and there was a problem about poaching abalone. Are they doing anything with the abalone? Because uh, I think, I don't know where, I don't remember where they were poaching from, probably Australian quarters. Yeah. But are they doing anything with that? So I haven't come across abalone. Hand dive scallops. There is another project that's doing she's quite similar. So there's two ways, and again, forgive me for those who aren't interested in their food. You can dredge. It destroys the marine life. You pick up lots of things that are not scallops. It's very bad for the oceans. Or you can hand dive, which is people going down. It's very labor intensive. It costs a lot more. Getting a hand dive certified scallop, you have no idea where it's really come from. So there's definitely some project. I wouldn't be surprised if there was abalone as well. And th this, is, this is a really interesting proof of concept because no one's ever done it end to end before. And I think this is going to be quite a powerful tool you'll see a lot more of. Um, challenges. So in the old system, before they used RFID tags, they used something called certificates. And one of the things that happens with certificates is people do double certification. So you effectively put the same certificate on two different things. It goes through the system. It looks like an anomaly, but actually what you've done is put adulterated food in. People are now cloning. RFID tags to effectively put the food in there. So you remember what I said about kind of crime is like water? Another way to look at it is like an arms race. We come up with something that stops them, they come up with something that goes around. There's no, you never get to yes. There is always a piece of technology they have that they can try and get around the technology. So that is a really big issue. Um, why am I excited about it and why have I got peeled garlic up there? So you remember I talked about the mass balance check. Mass balance check as a theory has been out there for many years. No one's ever really come up with a proper, secure way to do it before in a true, transparent way. And I think mass balance checks can help with a completely different issue, which is peeled garlic. So I don't know, I don't know why anyone would buy peeled garlic. Garlic comes in its own packaging, but believe me, in China, in India, peeled garlic is big business. Most of it comes from China. A very large percentage of it is produced by slave labor in prisons. So what you see are factories in China that produce peeled garlic for export. They will be certified, they will be reviewed. We have lots of clients that use these places. They will go in and audit them and they look great. When they get a big order in, a truck will go from the factory, it will go to the local prison down the road and it will do that several times a day and the work will not be done by workers who are getting paid a fair wage, it will be done by prisoners. The same garlic will come back into the system, it will look like it's been done in the factory. It's a real problem, and it's not just garlic, and it's not just China, it's lots of places around the world this happens. North Korea, Russia, uh, all kinds of places. Mass balance checks 
if you can automate factories and get access to that factory information, have it uploaded on a real-time blockchain, potentially allow you to identify that. And this is, this is probably, the, I mean, this is really difficult stuff. This is not easy. This is, you know, factories have different ways of doing it. There's no standardized inputs of information. How do you persuade a factory to upload this stuff if they're, what they're doing is, you know, basically putting criminally put... Like, but this is a really interesting thing, and this is one of the projects... What we do at Jones Day is we take the stuff that other people don't want to do because it's difficult and it's expensive and all that other stuff. So this is one that we're really interested in. So for any technology people out there who are interested in supply chains, factories, know how factories work better than I do, frankly, we are really interested in collaborating with people in industry to try and work out, can we solve this mass balance issue? Hello. Hi. Can I ask you for the fish? Yes. Um, how do they actually calculate the mass balance? Because fish has scales, right? Yes. So I would imagine a processing factory would remove the scales, which would remove the weight and so on. Again, a really excellent question. And that's where data sets come in. Your average fish will have an average amount of scales removed, and you'll be able to effectively assess whether the figures that you're getting out on the reading are consistent with the broad data set of average. So you know if you get far less than average, there's a risk that more stuff has been put in. So each step of the process can take account of that. It's only as good as your data set that you test it against. Yes. <laughs> it all comes back to data sets. Yeah, because garlic would have a lot more variability yeah. because we're talking about you know, each clove, how many cloves are there in a garlic, some garlic is big as well. And by the way, Pure garlic are actually also quite popular in Singapore. Are they really? Okay, well, yeah. they, I mean, so that's really I, it's a really, I mean, I, I find it very strange people would use peel garlic, but it's obviously very convenient. And the, the volumes that are involved yeah. probably make it quite clear. I mean, you're talking about truckloads of this stuff. So if you know what the throughput of the factory is, running at maximum speed, and you know how many, how speedy the machines are running at, you can make an assessment of how much output they can actually make, and you can baseline that over time. So one thing that we're quite interested in doing is if we go in with a client and we audit and we use that audit to set a baseline for a particular factory and we need to find a client who's willing to do this and a factory who's willing to do this if we ask them then to put extra stuff in their supply chain deliberately as a test can we pick it up so it's a re i personally i'm very excited about this so we'll see now i'm conscious of time um, the last thing i wanted to talk about and we will finish a little bit early in case anyone has questions um, it comes back to my point I said about technology having multiple uses. So this is the Moldovian Centre for Combating Trafficking. Moldova in Eastern Europe, former Eastern Europe, now wants to join the EU. Moldova has a real issue with child trafficking. And I don't mean child sex trafficking, I just mean child trafficking. Huge numbers of parents live and work outside Moldova. They leave their children with grandparents, they leave them with family friends, they work outside Monday to Friday because it's not a very developed economy and there's very little jobs opportunity. What you have are groups of vulnerable children, comparatively little adult oversight. It makes them real targets for trafficking. It's not a massive problem in Moldova. I don't want to give you the wrong impression about them, but it is not an issue they're very concerned about. And they've identified that traffic children often are taken over the border without identity documents. And so it was certain countries connected to Moldova, you don't need a passport to go across the border. You just need a photo form of ID. Traffickers give fake birth certificates, fake photo ID. They pretend to be the parents of the child. They take them across the border. What Moldova's done, really interesting. They have a blockchain-based system. And as a parent, you can upload your child effectively to that system and fingerprint iris. They now have fingerprint and iris mandatory scanning for any child that crosses the border. If the child crosses the border, they will send an alert to the parent's phone. So if the parent's traveling with them, not a problem. You know you're there. If it's not the parent or the nominated person and someone's trying to traffic your child, you get an alert on your phone. You can immediately call. There's a one hour window between going through security and actually being able to leave the compound, so it gives you a chance to stop it. Really interesting use of blockchain technology. But this is what I mean about technology having multiple uses. Would anyone else like to hazard a guess about a country that uses this system for a completely different purpose? It's not an Asian country, it's in the Middle East. 
been all in the news recently for uh, Apple and Google Play refusing to take a particular app off the system. Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia. So in Saudi Arabia, as a woman, you may not travel without the permission of your male guardian. And they have a system where if you go to the border, it sends an alert to your guardian's phone. And if you do not have his permission to travel, you will be turned back with all the consequences of that. Um, it's very interesting. And again, I should make clear, that's completely legal in that country. They see it as a very important protection for women. I make no comment on that from a political perspective, but you know, that is an app that complies strictly with the law in that country. I also say that the women who have managed to leave Saudi Arabia against their guardian's wishes have always done it by stealing their guardian's phone. So, <laughs> you know, there, there are always ways around this technology. But this is what I mean is, is it's exactly the same technology being used for a t totally different purpose. And that's why it's really important for people who are coming to these technologies, who are trying to do things, to really think about what are the consequences, what are the ethical considerations. And that's exactly what NIST is trying to do and why I'm very happy to be a part of it. So, in the last five minutes, it would be easy for me to be depressed, I have to say at this point. There are times when I get depressed. I've spent a lot of time in Thailand and Laos and Indonesia and places in the world where this is just a way of life and it's unremittingly depressing, let me tell you. And it's even more depressing to think that it's happening in my own country. You know, now I've seen it, I can't stop seeing it everywhere. However, I actually think the future is bright. And I will tell you why I think the future is bright. It is nothing to do with me or anything I'm doing or Jones Day is doing or any of these projects. It's because of millennials and Gen Zs. So I'm a long way away from millennial and Gen Z, let me tell you. I'm just, a, I'm in Gen X, so there we go. Um, the things that are, and I also say I don't subscribe to, there are lots of lazy stereotypes that get thrown around. You know, millennials, not ambitious, not driven, don't want to work, all of that sort of thing. I personally don't think that's true. I'm, I'm at a point where I'm recruiting millennials for Jones Day. They are ambitious, they are driven, but they are driven by a different value set than people like me are. And it's really important to understand that. And you kind of see this here. So if you look at everyone here, so health is the most important, family, happiness comes down third, marriage and partnership here. So marriage and partnership isn't even in the Gen Z set. <laughs> Yeah, happiness is the most important thing. I do think it's great that family is consistent across all of them, but happiness, now what does happiness mean? Happiness isn't necessarily personal happiness. This is, I mean, this is an American source, so I recognise there may be variations across countries and jurisdictions. But actually what this means is your value set is not necessarily driven by ownership. It's driven by experience, it's driven by transparency. You want to generally make the world a better place. And you want to make the world a better place far more than we ever did. So this is why I personally think that actually so much of the drivers for combating human trafficking is coming from young consumers. And you are requiring companies to deal with it. You're requiring them to be transparent. You are requiring them to tell you that you are producing sustainable products for you. So personally, I think the change is going to come. I think it's going to come from you guys just from your purchasing power rather than any tech solution I come up with. Um, but I did want to say sometimes, just sometimes, very complex problems have simple solutions. So, oh, do you want to come at this? Do you want to come? It's fine. No worries. We're all <laughs> um, so, has anyone ever heard of an ICD-10 code? Are we locked in? There we go. <laughs> You, I promise I haven't locked you in. So has anyone ever heard? Right, so Stephen's had ICD-10 codes, any visibility. So ICD-10 is a, it's a global system that's used in medical hospitals, particularly in the US, South America, uh, a little bit in Europe, sometimes in Asia. Every issue that you have medically has an ICD-10 code. Broken finger, twisted ankle, cancer, different kinds of cancer. And what these ICD-10 codes is they drive two things. They drive your care, so if you come with a broken arm, your ICD-10 code has a protocol that says how do you treat that broken arm. They also uh, drive data mapping. If you have 100 people with broken arms on average a year, you know how much stuff you need to treat broken arms. Um, one thing that Jones Day does every couple of years is bring together a group of people who would never otherwise be in the room together to talk about human trafficking. Business, government, 
NGOs, academics. It's a very small group. It's typically no more than 40 people. Uh, two years ago, we did one in the US. We're doing one in Singapore in November. Invitation only, and the idea is they have a sort of particular focus, and the one in the US had a focus on the medical industry. And we didn't go to talk about ICD-10 codes. None of us knew ICD-10 codes existed at that point. We were going to talk about the disaster relief piece. How can medical hospitals help drive trafficking in the medical system? And there was a point where someone who's the director of a hospital said, well, my biggest problem in dealing with human trafficking is there's no ICD-10 code for human trafficking. We were like, what's an ICD-10 code? So he explained, and we said, but there must be. And he's like, no, there is no ICD-10 code for human trafficking. There's one for domestic abuse, child abuse. There's this whole list, nothing for human trafficking. So I have no way to report it, unless I call the police, which I don't do because of my hypocritic oath. And we looked into it, and he was right. And it's just so astonishing to think that in this world there was just not a thing. So we then looked into how do you get an ICD-10 code approved. That is not easy. The average time is five years. We got it done in a year and a half by putting a team of 100 people from Jones Day on the whole process. We got it fast-tracked through. The ICD-10 code came into force. Well, it might have been less than 100 people, to be fair. A lot of people inputted into it. Uh, in about a year and a half, it came into force in June 2018. You can go to icd10.com net and look up the codes for human trafficking. There's about 10 of them now. What's really interesting about those codes is not just is it useful to have them so people can report, because there's a code, there now has to be a protocol. So pretty much every state in the US, lots of countries now have protocols for dealing in hospitals with people who've been human trafficked because there's an ICD-10 code. That is a perfect, simple, elegant tech solution that you never would have got if you hadn't got a group of people together. So one thing I would say to you, those of you who are in the technology space, who are looking at what you might do and things like that. If you have an idea that's like this, don't do what we did and think someone else must have thought of it because quite often these really simple solutions, unless you bring those multidisciplinary issues together, you have no idea they happen. It's probably the thing that we are most proud of. We would love to find another solution like this. So if anyone has any great ideas, do please let me know. And that was all I was going to say. We have a few minutes for questions. I know we've been going for a really long time. Um, if there are questions, I'm very happy to take them. Yeah, no, it's interesting. So, so, so yes, it's absolutely true. I mean, it's the non-binary genders, particularly in the US, there's comparatively less legal recognition. So even when you're working with someone who is transgender or transsexual, there will still be a piece where they are classified, at least as a matter of the law. But yes, absolutely. I mean, that particularly tends to affect people who were originally identified as male and may have transitioned or be part transitioning and now identify as female, they are particularly vulnerable to certain kinds of human trafficking, um, particularly in South America, I believe. I'm not hugely sort of known. But yeah, absolutely. We work with absolutely everyone. Anyone we can find who's a victim, who we think has a case and we can help, we try and take them on. Because there was a whole US yeah. trans survey, trans equality survey coming along. And they, they uh, sort of identified multiple factors that go into a white transgender woman may fare, for lack of a better word, slightly better than Hispanic women, trans women. So yeah, no. No, it's a really interesting point, actually, and it's a good reminder to me to be a little bit more thoughtful about the words that I use. Um, uh, we certainly deal with all kinds of people, and what you just described, you know, we see that across the whole range. So gender bias. You know, a, a white woman lawyer will statistically do significantly better for partnership than a, a woman a lawyer of colour, basically. And, and that, so you see that across the whole range of issues that affect people. Thank you. Any other questions? I have one question, just following on from that, because I noticed your slide where you had the different, um, this is a very early slide, different percentages yeah. of 
like you know, male, female who are likely to be into forced labor or, or for some other reason. Yeah. Uh, I think one of them, one of the categories was uh, for, for sex slavery, right? And you had, I think, 71% women yep. and the remainder were men. So I was actually wondering, is there any more statistics on, for the men, mm -hmm. was it for male, male sex slavery or was it for male, female sex slavery? So it's a really good question. So, so the, those statistics will be out there. They're taken from something called the Global Slavery... I'm just going to scroll back quickly. It'll take me a little while. Um, it's a hugely... The data set's available. Um, so so I, I, it, there definitely will be some analysis. I mean, one of the things I think is interesting yeah, is this one. this one here. Yeah, sex industry, you said 72% women. Yeah. So again, it doesn't take account of your point about how do people actually self-identify. I suspect that is biological rather than any kind of self-identification piece. Um, it also doesn't take account of, you know, the bare statistics. It, the data will be out there. One of the things I think is really interesting is how you know, the increased use of data, people are willing to delve into the data a little bit more, ask harder questions. A lot of these things are done manually, not automatically. And so there's a point where you have to decide how much data am I going to collect versus what's the most efficient way for me to do it. I suspect you'll see a lot more granular data come through four or five years' time because our ability to collect that and process that has become exponentially better. It's an interesting point. I just want to say thank you very much. I know it was the last session of the day. I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, thank you very much. If anyone's interested, the Institute certainly knows how to get hold of me. I will leave a copy of my slides as well, just in case you need them. Okay. Shall we thank Harry for her coming? Thank you.